Stay tuned for the next few minutes as MTD CNC explore the UK manufacturing sector's view on the EU referendum. We talk to Alan Halsell, who sits on the board of the Vote Leave campaign, and also Jürgen Meyer, who's the CEO of Siemens, and he's firmly in the Remain camp. But not only those, we also talk to and explore the opinions of UK manufacturers, you guys, precision engineers, subcontractors and OEMs. MTD CNC, bringing you the latest engineering news via video media. So I'm here today at Siemens headquarters in the UK to talk to the UK boss, Jürgen Meyer, about some strong reasons why the UK should remain in the EU. So Jürgen Meyer, you're the boss of the UK division of a large global company with headquarters in Germany. So clearly your perspective is that Britain is better off in the EU. But can you um, see the perspective of a small British-owned company in, in the EU referendum debate? Yeah, totally I can. And, uh, you know, very often the thing you hear is around overburdensome regulation. Um, a couple of things I would say is that, first of all, you know, we are a large manufacturer here in the UK with our 13 factories building a 14th. In our supply chain are lots of these small companies that you refer to. And I do totally understand that it can be a bit of a pain to have to comply to all of the same regulation that we large companies have to. But the fact is these companies are in our supply chain. Mm. We end up exporting the product somewhere else. So there is no choice mm. but to comply to that regulation. So this sort of notion that we sometimes hear is that actually, you know, only five or some say 10% of our manufacturers export. It's not really true because they're exporting through a larger company and that's why they need to comply to the regulation. The other thing I would just say on regulation is that actually, whilst we don't like regulation, and by the way, we don't either, in a large company like Siemens. But if you actually look at it, it is designed to improve the level playing field within which we operate. So therefore it creates fairer competition in markets across the EU. And it also drives up innovation in areas like environmental compliance, or it might be safety issues. So there's always, or generally, there is a very good reason why these things are mm. happening. So it's always quick to criticise, but yeah. You're referring mainly to regulation in terms of electronic um, engineering standards, but on another area of regulation, and forgive me, this isn't on my list, but <laughs> if we look at something like um, HR and employment regulation, do, do you think small British companies have a case to say, actually, it would be less bureaucratic if we were an independent country outside the EU? Well. Um, again, you know, you know, sometimes we hear of this regulation, you know, and recently there has been regulations about harmonised uh, holiday days, uh, uh, for example, and you think, gosh, you know, that's a bit of a pain. But then on the other hand, you think, well, you know, isn't it fair that within a single trading market, we basically give the same sorts of conditions to mm -hmm. all of the people who are working within that. And actually, when I often ask the question, and this is to small or large business, and I say, what sort of regulation that is coming out of Europe right now, which is a real pain for you and your employment? Mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, that people will talk to you about is actually the living wage. Right. Now, that is not a European uh, regulation. That's one that we created here in the United Kingdom. I'm not making a judgment it's good or bad. I actually think it's a good thing. But, you know, it's not like all of this terrible stuff comes out of Europe. And usually, you know, it's quite well thought through with regard to creating this level playing field. Sometimes Brussels gets it wrong. And clearly, as part of us remaining in the EU, one of the things we have to do is to push back at Brussels to make sure what they are doing is always thought through and really adding value to what we're trying to do in our industry. You've got to be in it to amend it, sort of thing. Well, and, and, and absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, on trade, now many people, both who are undecided uh, and who wish to leave, uh, have made the point that if the UK left the European Union, uh, countries in the European Union will not stop trading with Britain overnight or even over several months. It's not going to stop the trade. Um, I mean, can, can you express how 
What will be different about trade if the UK were to, to, to leave? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, you are absolutely right. Trade would not stop overnight. You know, there might be an issue where some tariffs are put uh, on the trade. Um, some are saying not because, you know, people will want to trade with us. But the real misunderstanding on this is not tariffs at all. Let's say tariffs went on our products to and fro between Europe. It would probably add somewhere between 3 and 5%. I mean, that's large, but it's not the most significant. Mm -hmm. The much more significant issue is that what we would see is we would see an erosion of the standards that have been created across the EU and disadvantages, barriers would start coming in the way for British exporters by way of the things we call non-tariff barriers. Mm -hmm. Now, there has been several estimates done and that is that all of these non-tariff barriers, which is creating a level playing field, has actually reduced the burden and cost of manufacturers in the UK by at least 20%. So we're comparing 20% to 3%. Now that 20% wouldn't rise overnight. It would be a slow creeping process over a period of time. Mm -hmm. And just to put a few facts on that, we had a quick look at the sort of standards that affect our 13 factories here in the UK. And if you go to before the single market, there was around 160,000 national pieces of regulation that we and similar industries would have needed to comply to, to send a different standard for Italy, France, etc., etc. Today, those standards, because we normally harmonise and would create out of 28 national standards, one single EU standard, today we have to comply to 19,000 standards. Mm -hmm. You imagine mm -hmm. the you know, the improvement in productivity that we can create in our factories as a result of that. Impressive numbers. I suppose one could say, though, that you, your factory, certainly in Congleton, to, springs to mind, makes motor drives. It's quite a complicated piece of equipment, and it's going to have to comply with many different types of standards across the EU member nations. But companies that make simpler components, do you think the parallel can be drawn that regulation is also standard regulation is being reduced for those simpler parts as well, by, by being a member of the EU? Yeah, no, and, and, and you are right, you know, that can be an issue you know so if it is a uh, you know a, uh, a less complex part then you know applying that same level of regulation might be an issue and this is where you know sometimes we have to push back and work with Brussels to say look you know let's do regulation where really it creates uh, an advantage although a point um, that's also worth making is, is that very often the simpler parts end up in a product which is more complicated mm -hmm. so it has no choice but to actually that's have right. the same standard Alan, you've grown very successful businesses and you've done that whilst in the EU. Would it not restrict companies these days if we were out of the EU to do the same or replicate what you've achieved? I think that it will be easier. Uh, uh, nice of you to say that, by the way, about my own businesses, but I think it will be easier to develop businesses uh, if we're outside the EU. Because, you know, I think that there will be, um, first of all, a massive saving for this country. Uh, something like 10 billion net and that 10 billion net whilst it can go on various public services it can also go on assisting industry existing business throughout the country so that's the first thing to say the second thing to say is that if we're outside the EU uh, I would suggest that 95% of businesses in this country do not trade with the EU but 100% of businesses in this country have to deal with EU regulations and directives we talk about regulations, Alan, but give us an example of a couple of regulations that might affect a small manufacturer. Well, the sort of, the sort of regulations, I mean, there are thousands of regulations and directives that come out of the unelected uh, oligarchs in Brussels. And the sort of thing is health and safety, for instance, where, again, you know, I'm not suggesting for one minute that if we came out of the EU, we would not have any health and safety regulations. But I do know that ever since we've been in the EU, it's piled on one after the other after the other, impacted my business at Silver Cross. And I would rather, instead of those unelected oligarchs in Brussels deciding those regulations, I would rather it was decided over there in the House of Commons, in our Parliament, because that way, if we didn't like those regulations, we could always uh, elect a new, a new government to come in rather than the officials who stay in Brussels. Another example is the Agency Workers Directive, where you take small businesses have to take on uh, agency workers to help out temporarily, and then if you keep them for a certain number of months, 
they get all the full-time rights. These are things that, dare I say it, are, are, are sent from the top down. In, in Brussels, they think this is a good idea, this is a good idea, and they produce regulation after regulation after directive after directive, and that impacts massively. And I want, I want them to be in this country, entrepreneurs succeeding and doing well. I don't see that. Europe is, 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 doesn't seem to me to be a, con, um, a political union that is particularly working for, our, for businesses. Britain has, we have such great entrepreneurs in this country, some great business people. Let them flower, let them get on without having the, 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 the guiding hand of, of, of Brussels. So I'm taking from your comments, if I was a UK manufacturer, which there are thousands out there, and I was exporting my products to Europe, I'd be better off out. Well, I exported my products all over the world. And I'll tell you why you'd be better off out, because you'd have opportunities. We have no trading agreements in this country, the IE UK, with America, India, China, we, 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 Australia. We're not allowed to do our own free trade agreements. So my view is, yes, we would be better off out, because we'd have an opportunity with free trade agreements around the world. Now, would that impact on my business with the EU? Absolutely not. There, we are at the moment up against... Uh, what I would call an establishment. We're up against big business, the CBI, uh, uh, and all the all the all the, the the fat cats, if you like, and and small businesses, that, you know, like I am, and who who uh, who we have a lot of supporters in Vote Leave. That's that's what we're up against. And as far as I'm concerned, for all I can all I can see with them is that they are trying to say, oh, you can't trade with the EU. It could impact on the EU if we leave the EU. Remember, from Iceland in the west to Turkey in the east. There is not one country, with the exception, I think, of Belarus, that does not have a free trade agreement with e the EU. So, of course, we'll have free trade. Uh, of course, we will be able to trade. And then the other thing is, companies trade with companies, not biz um, uh, corporate blocks with corporate blocks. And why do we want to be part of a political block when only we could be part of a free trade block, like we have in America, we have in the United States, Canada, and Mexico? They're not in a political block, they have a free trade block like we have in um, ASEAN, like you have in, in South America, Mercosur. Free trade, that's what we want, that's what I want, that's what Vote Leave wants. We want to say no to political union, but yes to free trade. So if your product's good enough, you can sell it anywhere and everywhere? Well, anyone in business knows that, it's all about product. If my pram wasn't good enough, I wouldn't be able to sell And I sold them in Spain, I sold them in France, but I sold them in China as well. So with this being the case in Alan, why are manufacturers, or, or why would you, vote leave be behind in the polls at the moment? Are, are UK manufacturers and the rest of the UK not getting this message? Uh, I don't think, the first thing to say is a poll came out only today uh, and it actually showed we're ahead. So I don't accept that we're behind in the polls. Uh, yes, I think there are a lot of, as I said earlier, the establishment, if you like, the establishment that is, it is very, very, very keen on staying in. Because, I mean, you, 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 look at, you look at what is going on in the EU, you know, I dare I say it, there is a bit of a gravy trade. And don't forget big companies, big corporates, they love the EU. And why do they love the EU? Because I think they employ something like 30,000 lobbyists. And again, dare I say it, that there's a lot of secrecy in the EU. Those lobbyists are working hard, producing um, legislation, working with the European Commission, unelected, to produce legislation. Why don't we have uh, legislation produced from there? We have the, one of the oldest parliaments in the world. Why aren't they producing our legislation? Well, they're elected, why can't we let them do it? Why are we letting so much legislation come out of the EU? It's an issue of sovereignty for me, and therefore big business, if they can influence that legislation, as they are doing consistently, to ensure that it supports their, their way. And that is what is happening. And, I think it showed very interestingly with the VW scandal recently of the emissions. Why didn't that come out? Why did it have to come out in America? It was the United States that found out what was going on. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a believer that actually uh, the European Commission knew, and the EU knew exactly what was happening with VW. And there was a very interesting article in the FT about it recently. Roger, big decision to make. Which way are you leaning as an individual? As an individual, I'm leaning to keep in. OK, and what's the reason behind that? I think it's what I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Being in manufacturing and engineering, I feel that the benefits that we get as a country uh, are very much one-sided in, in terms of what happens for 
the industry itself. So the benefits are for large companies and small OEMs, and we have a mixture of those within our membership. So I feel that's, that, that's where my influence is coming from. The clue's in the name, Tom, Subcon Laser Cutting. You are a UK subcontract manufacturer. What's your thoughts on the EU referendum? The EU referendum, I believe, is it's a real difficult one for manufacturing, certainly if you're involved in manufacturing, because there is so much um, nonsense being spread by the, the Remain camp, the, uh, the, uh, the Exit camp, and it's, it, it, it's tough, certainly for manufacturers, to get an even view on, on, on what's best to do. Michael, by your engineering, you've been in existence for over 70 years. Can you tell me your view of opting out of Europe or staying in? I'm very much in favour of staying inside Europe. Um, the stability that is offered uh, with the, the, the current trading relations we have in Europe and other parts of the world, I think the uncertainty that would be uh, thrown at us if we decide to get out of Europe are going to set us back a long way. And so definitely stay in Europe. Ray RDL Technology, it's a large turn part manufacturer. It's the EU referendum coming up in June. How are you going to vote? Why? And how is it going to affect RDL Technology? Uh, yeah, uh, from RDL's perspective, Joe, I personally will be voting to stay into the EU. I feel that it's the best thing for industry. Um, obviously, it's the best thing for RDL for us to be one European community and it just makes trading easier. We've been in a long time now. Um, I think there are certain things that perhaps we, we could have done and should have done and I think we should be at times a little harder on the, uh, the people that run Brussels. Uh, I'm disappointed sometimes in what we go out to try and do and what we come back with. What would you see as a negative if we were to leave? From a negative point of view, I believe we are vulnerable to uh, not short term, but longer term in, in investment because we don't have our own industry anymore. Years ago, when we had uh, the steel manufacturers, the shipbuilding, the car manufacturers, uh, coal, we, we owned our own industry. Because we now, uh, all the, our industry is predominantly owned by foreign manufacturers, we are very vulnerable. Simon, you've been involved in the manufacturing sector, machine tools for many years. You've been the president of the MTA. Obviously with the European referendum coming up on the 23rd of June, could you tell me your view and how this may affect if you opted in or opted out? Mark, um, the European Union question uh, is on everybody's tongue at the moment. Um, from a personal point of view, uh, I hope that uh, we vote to remain within the EU as uh, I think in our particular sector um, of manufacturing, um, everybody's heavily involved uh, in exporting to Europe uh, and also importing from Europe. I think the supply chains um, are well managed within the European Union and I think if you also look at a lot of our customers' components, um, such as the aerospace components and the oil and gas components, um, they're manufactured um, across Europe uh, in many different countries and they get assembled in, a, in other parts of Europe. So there's a complete supply chain um, set up within the European Union uh, and it works. Um, and if it works, why change it? Ryan, CJ Engineering, yourself as a partner in the company, would you vote in or out? Out. And the reason? I think the, com the country's well and good enough to support itself. I don't think we need any other influence. I think we're more than sustainable. Um, I just think all round would be better for us. Simon, shortly it's an important referendum. Can I ask if you're in or out? I'm definitely in. And why is that? I think we would cope on our own fine, um, but basically to encourage and make things easier within the school groups that are available within Europe, it makes things easier and part of the big club. So for me, I'm definitely in. Ben, BW Precision, Brexit, in or out? Well, do we truly know what we get for staying in or getting out? So maybe bet the devil we know, stay in. The other side of things is the people who are not in our industry or even in, perhaps even in work, there's a different approach, a totally different approach. They're very much concentrating on the day-to-day, the -day, how will it affect me personally? 
Um, I'm not being arrogant by saying I'm, we're looking at a bigger picture. I don't believe the EU as a bloc would welcome the fact that the uh, UK would be out. So I think they would be driving uh, a total renegotiation package. For the rest of the world, it's, it, it, it's a grey area. And do you think it'll help your business? Um, it could well definitely help us. We have a multicultural bunch of staff here at Chang'an, which is right near the business park, where we do prototyping for China manufacturer as a car OEM. But don't we deal with China anyway, even if we weren't in the EU? Sure we would, yeah, we would. But particularly for the UK facilities, we've got a lot of people from, from Europe who come in. We have very specialist skills that are, we, we need to go within Europe. We can't get them in the UK. I'm not a great believer that if we vote to come out, um, things will change dramatically. You know, we, we still need immigration and we still need flows of people leaving the country and coming into the country. Um, we're very fortunate in the UK at the moment because we have very low unemployment um, and so therefore if we're going to expand uh, our manufacturing base, we need new people and we need uh, exciting uh, engineers uh, from overseas as well as our own homegrown engineers. We currently are employing recently people from Poland, uh, people from Spain, um, because we were struggling as a company to find the skill base that these people already come with uh, and brought to our company. Uh, so we employed them because they had the skills, they had the technical knowledge that was, wasn't in, in the UK uh, that we could find in, in, in trying to fill technical positions. In all of this, Tom, it's a difficult decision. Hugely. It it's causes sleepless nights, I think. If you were to simplify three strong reasons that, that, you know, for, for companies to remain in the EU, but right across the board for different types of manufacturing, what would those three principles be? Well, I think the first is definitely access to this single market. And don't forget, this is not just about tariffs. Much more important is the standardization and is the fact that we've got a level playing field, it's harmonized and it's easier to do business within it. Mm. So that's point number one. Point number two is very important that we have influence on what those standards and regulation are going to be. Yeah, I mean, as far as Siemens is concerned, we can have influence on those from from within Germany, from within France or whatever, but my job here in the UK mm. is to make sure that the 13 factories we have here, that we're influencing and making sure the standards that are set are useful and are helping the factory here in the UK to remain, to be prosperous, to be able to grow. So influence is the second point. And the third point, very important, is that a lot of the R&D programs we're involved with are pretty large programs. And by the way, I want to point out they're large, but ultimately with lots of opportunities for small, innovative startup companies to get involved with. But the programs of a scale for developing the future of driverless cars, how we're putting electric hybrid propulsion onto future aircraft. These are massive R&D programs and no single European country, not even Germany, has got the clout has got the bandwidth to fund all of that. So we need to collaborate together to make sure we're competing against the other two major blocks, which are the USA and China. And the better we do that collaboratively, and the more influence we have on that, the more of that industry we can bring to the United Kingdom and create jobs and prosperity in those industries here. But Jürgen, with all this these standards and regulations that one has to face, particularly as an SME in the EU, um, you know, surely this is a good reason for many people to, to question whether it's worth remaining in the EU. Yeah, and, and I do fully understand that if you're a small engineering company, you know, all of this regulation, it seems a bit much that you have to conform to. But what we need to remember is that what all of this regulation is designed to do is to create a level playing field, in many areas a pretty high standard, a standard of very high environmental compliance, in other words, energy efficient products that we within Europe have to comply to. And what that is also designed to do is to make sure that the consumer makes is sure that when he's buying a product, it has that standard. Now, if we suddenly let all of that regulation 
drop down and we say we're going to do less of it. Nice, less bureaucracy for a small company. But what it means is we now allow in competition from China, which is fine, but it's bringing it in at a non-level playing field. Mm. In other words, products don't have the same standards. Right. And there is a report by the Leave campaign, written by Patrick Minford. It's a very good report. It actually says that prices will come down if we drop this regulation. Absolutely right. What he also rightly points out is that this would eliminate British manufacturing. And that would ultimately be a result of just dropping our standards on all of this European regulation. So really, the regulation argument is it protects our interests because it keeps prices high and competitive where companies can make a profit. Well, it's not just, you know, it's not about keeping prices high. I mean, actually, it allows us to innovate, but it means that we're giving the consumer absolute certainty that what he's buying mm. is what it says on the tin. It's a high standard, high safety standard, high environmental standard, and the consumer is protected from imports that wouldn't meet those same levels of regulation. So if on the 23rd of June the country votes out, in your opinion, what are we going to be in five years' time? Well, I think, I genuinely think for, for, and we're talking about here, small businesses, engineering, manufacturing businesses, like the business I had that manufactured prams, I think it's absolutely unbelievable opportunity. For a start, we're bringing back, I would like to think, regulation and control back to this country. Back to elected officials in Westminster, who we can unelect if we don't like what they're doing. That's great. But the second thing is, and this is uh, perhaps, it's, it's harder to explain to you, but I think that this country has been producing some of the best business people for hundreds of years. We innovate all the time. And I genuinely believe that the EU does not encourage innovation. It does not encourage that development of the business. In fact, it is really quite anti-business. And, and it is pro-large business. It is small businesses that become the big businesses of tomorrow. It is encouraging those entrepreneurs, those manufacturers. And I honestly believe that we've got to have a different philosophy in this country and that that can come about as a result of coming out of the EU. I really do believe that. And we can let people flower. And I think this country will show you in five years' time what it's done. And I really, really hope that we have that opportunity. We'll never have it again. Vote leave. This is only going to come up once, this referendum, in our lifetime. If we lose, we'll be in for a long time. We're going to have the euro issues and everything else. Please let us get out now and let people prosper and let the country prosper. I think it's a very important message. It's been a really interesting exercise, very educational for me well as well. But let's, let's kick off with the leave. What, what, sure. what are your thoughts on what you heard from Alan and you know, the parties that, that said they would look to leave, although there wasn't that many. And it has to be said, the reason for that is a lot of engineers um, that were, I'd say the split was 50-50, that were, were up for leaving, didn't actually want to go on camera. So again, be interesting to, to maybe see why you think that is too. But, but give us your overview on the leave side. Well, on, on that point about the going on camera, I've noticed on LinkedIn, sort of independently, that there are a lot of people come on to the Manufacturing UK LinkedIn group uh, who are quite keen to leave the EU. I called one or two of them, of course I won't mention names, and they weren't keen to appear on the film. It seems to be something that until recent weeks the Leave campaign has had a bit of problem with and that's getting the business community to explain, express in business terms what, why it's, it's good to leave. And I suppose it feeds into that sense from the British public that better the devil you know, even though there's a sort of um, underlying gripe that we're spending too much money on EU membership. And that's a key point because um Alan mentioned the 10 billion net savings, which is a very controversial figure, mm. um, which we're hearing a lot about. What do you think about that? It's a lot of money. I mean, I think one thing is that both parties, both campaigns would contest that figure. Um, the figure that on the battle bus for vote leave is 350 million pounds a week. Of course, if you, if you take into account the rebate and um, I think other charitable donations and other bits and pieces, you know, it does reduce considerably in the Remain campaign would claim it's more like 120 a week, which is a huge difference. Um, but on the face, £10 billion is a lot of money. I, th I think there's a really interesting and difficult to prove argument that some of that money, if we did leave, if Britain left the European Union, could be siphoned or, or put into manufacturing investment. Things like reinstituting MAS, the Manufacturing Advisory Service, uh, funding more apprenticeships, uh, bankrolling more investments in the HVM catapult, other catapults, 
and the innovation agenda. The, the, question, the, the issue is, would it actually happen? Because I think there'd be a huge amount of pressure to do any NHS and other, other public services as well. On that point, talking <clears> to Tom from Subcon Laser, he has recently recruited, as he said on camera, individuals from the EU. And he's done that because he hasn't been able to find those skills here in the UK. Mm. So there's one thinking, well, hang on, if, if we left, he's not going to be able to do that. But you could also counter argue that if we left and we saved that, that money, whatever the figure may be, we could invest in the youth, more apprenticeships, as, as you've said. So it's, it, 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 it is a difficult one. I, I would love, it, as a, I, I personally, who knows what I, I feel, and that's not important, but let's imagine the UK left the EU. It would be great if some of the money we saved could be put into manufacturing engineering apprenticeships. That would be a, a really sensible, uh, value-add, meaningful thing to do with the cash. But the problem is, I think a lot of the companies that need skilled people now can't wait for that uh, lag time for people to be trained. I mean, who's going to wait five years for uh, a time-served apprentice to, to be trained? So um, it, it doesn't really solve the problem by training your own in the short term, and, and that's the period that we're talking about. Is it about. long term or is it short term? This, this is the question as well, because also a couple of the things that Alan mentioned was about the fact that 95% 90, of businesses do not actually trade with the EU, but 100% have to conform to the regulation. Yeah. You know, is that right? No. 95% <laughs> um, of businesses do not trade with the EU, but we all have to comply with the regs. That's tough. Um, I, on the regulation aspect, it was a point that came up time and time again. And I think it's important that perhaps we discuss the difference between trade regulation, the ease with which a company can do business and transact with European countries, <clears throat> and regulation per se. Because I think in the whole debate, in the panels on television, it's been very badly expressed this, this amount of bureaucracy from Brussels when it comes to general business regulation, how much worse it would really be than having the regulation from Westminster. Uh, I mean, an example that Alan, ha Alan Halsell uh, raised was health and safety. Health and safety EU regulation has really punished his company, Silver Cross, that make uh, high quality prams. Um, but let's be honest, if you're making a uh, very fine tolerance aerospace or nuclear component for the global, a global market, a global industry, um, the tolerances, the accuracy, the accreditation and the health and safety, uh, uh, all those, all those uh, regs would be, you, you know, you would be uh, compliant with those regardless of whether we're in the EU or out. It's a global industry. Mm -hmm. So there's regulation, there's regulation. But I can see how for a, a, a footloose, you know, a nimble business like Silver Cross doesn't want to get sort of hampered by this H&S regulation. But, but on the regulation point as well, he, he mentioned about agency staff having similar rights after three months mm. uh, you know to well having similar rights as a, as a full-time skilled worker for example now it, again is that right does that not shackle a small business into thinking well hang on a minute you know can I take the risk of taking on agency staff at, at yeah. the possibility that that it's gonna put a noose around my neck in six months time you can kind of see that argument as well. Yeah, you can. That's, that's tough. Um, again, I think it's in the, the devil's in the detail. If I was a, um, a small business employer, and I, and I guess I am, but I don't employ agency workers, um, you, you know, after three months, will I want to give them full-time rights? That sounds punitive. And it's not, as Alan said, um, it's not very pro-entrepreneurialism. It, it's the kind of thing that... Um, detractors of the EU say comes from the bureaucrats and the oligarchs in Brussels and it's being laid down upon small innovative entrepreneurial businesses. Having said that, if you are, are one of those workers and you want a job and you want security, it, 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 that sort of regulation is in your favour. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of um, give and take. Um, but you I, could counter argue that and say, well, if you, uh, that job may not be available to you on a short term contract because the employer won't take the risk of growing his business to take more people on because he doesn't want to be shackled by that regulation. So you might not get that opportunity at all if you're uh, looking, for a, looking for a position. Yeah, no, I think on that agency workers directives, it is a tough one. Um, but one thing that um, is worth pointing out, and I think, I think Jürgen Meyer did it in his piece, is that some of the employment um, legislation that w we're abiding by at the moment in business or, or about to actually comes from the UK and it's not an EU directive. And one of them that's hitting companies all over the place is the national minimum wage. Uh, now, whether or not you approve of it, and many people do, businesses still have to conform, but we created it. So yeah, not yeah. all uh, 
bad news comes from Brussels. So in summary, on the leave side, it, it, the, the focus is from a, from a lot of the people we've spoken to, it is about the money. It is about the regulation. It is about having a small business, maybe potentially looking to grow it. But I think more, more, more interestingly as well, it's about the fact that in a lot of instances, they haven't been prepared to, to voice that on camera. But Alan was certainly very, very vocal in that respect. And finally, on, on perhaps on leave, I think he was so vocal on free trade agreements between all countries. Yeah. What a lovely nirvana that would be. Uh, the fact is that you know, we don't have these FTAs between um, all the trading countries the UK trades with. Uh, and that part of that, the reason is because we're in the EU, of course. But if we left, first of all, how long would it take to negotiate those free trade agreements? Leave campaign would say, well, don't worry about the length of time. It's going to be good for the long run. Um, but, you know, we've seen, I think, evidence that, uh, that, that Canada has a free trade agreement with, with Britain that's taken something like eight years to negotiate. So if you're in business, it, it is this problem that you've got to work out how long it's going to take to work out an FTA with another country. And sometimes it's better to stay where you are. This block. would bring me on to <clears> the in because when, when, we, when we look at the remainers, certainly from the manufacturers, um, we'll come on to Jürgen shortly, but from the manufacturing perspective, there is a lot of better the devil you know. You know, There's that comfort factor. There's the fact that you know, we, we've been in the EU, business is okay, you know, we're doing all right at the moment. Do we want to put that at risk? Mm. Is that a good enough reason to remain? Hmm. Uh, I think it really depends on the industry you're in. Because I, I touched on earlier the difference between manufacturing sort of textiles or luxury goods like prams versus the aerospace industry, which is global. Um, and it, it, yes, I think it really depends on what you do. Um, I mean, we're at Subcom, and um, a lot of the companies at Subcom in the subcontract SME space are uh, making manufacturing parts for large assemblies that are made by and sold by global OEMs. If you make a component for a Siemens or a, you know, GE is an American company, but, but you know, a Bosch or um, you know, uh, perhaps a Vinci in France or Alstom, you know, if you left the EU or remained in, you've got to have, you have to make the part to the specifications that that company gives to you to be in its supply chain. Now, if those specifications are partly mandated, partly affected by that country's membership of the EU, then it sort of makes sense that Britain is in the EU because then you know, your, your paperwork will comply naturally to your OEM customer. Um, but you could argue that, look, uh, if we're out of the EU, uh, we're not going to spend as much money uh, and I can do the paperwork for Siemens or for Bosch very happily myself. It just sort of sounds intuitive that it's going to be easier it, it, if you're in... It could in... become more complicated. Yeah. There's, there's no guaranteed outcome. And if you look at some of, some of our clients and our customers from a from a machine tool distribution perspective or from a tooling distribution perspective, if they're importing products from, from Europe, you know, things are going to change, you know, potentially. And, and that could impact on their business. It could make it more, it could, it could potentially increase lead times. Uh, it, it, could, it could mean that, that costs change. So that could impact on their business. So you can see a very strong argument for that type of, uh, of client of ours to, to favour favor the remain. But there is this big argument, uh, uh, it's the big company versus the small company. That's right. You know, is, it, is it about big business remaining? I think if you were to assess Alan Halsell's pitch, it did seem to come down to big versus small. You know, the, there are bureaucrats and lobbyists. I think he said something like 30,000 people are employed in the, in the lobbying profession <clears throat> in Brussels, which sounds extraordinary. Uh, and, uh, you know, the implication is that, that those people are employed to get uh, to uh, generate and, and um, get the EU to comply with the will of big business. Trouble is, is all that lobbying and regulation really that bad? I mean, some of this uh, has in the environment at its heart. You know, th there's some good reasons to be bureaucratic in the sense that the companies are not just doing it to make profits. They're, they're, you know, the regulation has been created so that we have a level playing field and we're doing the right things by the, uh, the protocols, Paris and Kyoto, to keep carbon emissions down. But yeah, he was pitching it very much as a big versus small. And I suppose it does seem to be, that there's an air of sense there, of, of truth there, isn't it? That mm -hmm. as a small company, you might be freer and less uh, shackled if you left one of these um, supranational blocks like the EU. And when you, when you hear uh, Jürgen's interview that, that you did, he is very much about big business. It is about, yeah. uh, 
a, a community of, of companies, it's about a community of countries working together to produce and innovate. Um, and that was very apparent to listening to, mm. to Jürgen. And, and in fact, you know, access to the single market makes it easier to do business, which for big business, that's great. You know, mm. let's mm. touch on the monetary point because there is also an interesting statistic. We talk about the 10 billion net savings if we left the EU. Again, controversial figure, mm. but um, it has been used. There is, there is a slant to this where some of that money can be or is being invested into R&D programs, which is what Jürgen was talking about, um, which are developing new innovations and new products, which at the moment we are involved in. Yeah. If we leave, we're not. Yeah, there's two, two points to the, the money within the EU on the Remain camp, I think, that are really important. As you say, uh, Paul, very importantly, globally, there are some really big engineering science projects uh, coming through in the next 20 years that are going to transform the way we do things. Things like driverless cars, things like Industry 4.0, you know, the digital factory and smart cities. Now, if you're involved in those programs as a member of a block, uh, yes, you could argue the toss either way, but generally, you know, you're going to be better off combining the brain power and the money of 28 member nations or 50 states, as in the case of the US, you know, collective brain power and money to, to, to um, advance those programs more quickly <clears throat> than if you're an isolated country outside the, the mix. That, that just makes sense, doesn't it? It, uh, it does, because we, could we embark on those projects on our own? No, we couldn't. I think it'd be very hard. I mean, we've got a fantastic science base, some of the best universities in the world. I think the QS rankings put, you know, Oxford, Cambridge and the LSE in the top 10 regularly. So we've got great, great brain power, but you're, you will never replicate the combined brain power and, and resources, the funding of 28 member states. Of course, you can then argue, well, hang on, does the, um, the money we put in uh, is it distributed evenly? Aren't we doing a bit more than the Slovenians or, uh, uh, or the Greeks, for example? But, but you know, the, the point is you're, you're better in it together, I think, in terms of funding engineering. The other th thing to mention quickly about the, um, the money we get back from the EU, there are projects funded by, through the uh, European Commission, like Horizon 2020, which funds um, discreetly uh, engineering programmes run by universities in Britain and across the EU, one of them being run by six Midlands universities, I think headed by... Uh, Birmingham is looking at cold energy and this is capturing um, uh, basically a powertrain derived from uh, liquid gas. Now that type of funding wouldn't necessarily be available to us if we weren't within the EU because it comes from the Horizon 2020 80 billion, pound, 80 billion euro budget. Um, now yes we could possibly fund some of it ourselves but 80 billion? I, I think from, from my perspective it is a very compelling argument the fact that you know standing independently we certainly wouldn't be able to potentially achieve or be part of those innovations um, and and you know and the future of technology uh, being outside of it so that that is uh, yeah it's a very very important point mm. but I think to wrap up it is also very important to say that there are so many people that are undecided we've yeah. seen it you know it, it, it's that indecision it's there's there's but, personal factors but coming back to business and manufacturing both sides have got very strong cases. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, as, a, as a person rather than a manufacturing fan, um, the, the argument has been slightly conflated by emotion and uh, your personal characteristics, where you live, immigration, these things. On a business level, it, it isn't easy, is it? I mean, I think the common sense approach, if you're in engineering that um, has to comply with lots of international accreditation for metrology, for quality control, um, you know, the, the EU is perhaps a little bit irrelevant and better the devil you know than the devil you don't. But, but that's just the personal opinion. I think if you're being punished by, you know, acres of um, unnecessary regulation from Brussels, if you're in a non uh, mission critical field of engineering, I can see why as a small company that could be bureaucratic. But isn't it the case that, that most engineers we're talking to, they're undecided, could it be it's better the devil they know, business is good, things are going well, you know, they're making money, uh, they're making product. So actually, mm. we're all right, let's vote in. I don't know whether that's a good enough argument because this, well, is, a, this is a long-term decision, it's not gonna come round again. And uh, I, think, I think on the business level, Paul, uh, I can't really comment. I think it's a very individual thing, isn't it? Are you being hit by the EU bureaucracy and does the free trade, the uh, f access to the single market, does that compensate 
for the, uh, the amount of red tape that you, you face. Uh, it probably comes down to what you make and who you deal with. You know? But I, I, I do see some sense in that if we weren't uh, a member of a supranational bloc, we would have more freedom to go and trade with who we wish rather than as a, a, a bloc. The trouble is, how long would it take to negotiate a free trade agreement and how, how um, expensive would it be? So we could be talking short-term short pain for long-term gain. Could well be. Who yeah. knows? So thanks, Will. It has been an extremely interesting exercise. I've thoroughly enjoyed the last couple of weeks. Hopefully this film has been uh, educational for you as well, and hopefully we've touched on things that will help you when you're trying to make an informative decision. Now remember, it's not all about manufacturing. You know, th there's a lot of other issues surrounding your vote on June the 23rd. But hopefully you've enjoyed this footage, and thanks for watching.